to the Better Government Association's 2021 Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Awards for Investigative Reporting, A Remedy for Wrong. For Illinois journalists, winning a Driehaus Award provides career-affirming recognition. This year's awards will be no different. Hello, my name is Marta Carrera Slave, and I'm truly honored to guide you through today's celebration of great investigative journalism. I have been a member of the BGA's Board of Directors for seven years. Before I became a lawyer, I was a broadcast journalist in central Illinois, including Springfield, which means I know a little something about reporting on scandals and government failings. So when this great organization that works for transparency and accountability in government invited me to join its board, I jumped at the chance. My family is originally from Cuba. I left Havana in 1969 at a very young age. We couldn't immigrate directly to the United States from Cuba, so we lived in Spain for two years before receiving our green card and starting our new life in Chicago. Chicago is a vibrant immigrant city. I love the city and the state. It's where I have planted my family's roots. Now, as an immigrant whose family fled a dictatorship, we have much in common with the work of the BGA which is fighting to shed a light on corruption in government. I saw firsthand the importance of a free press and an informed people to a strong democracy. In fact, when I returned to my homeland of Cuba a few years ago as an adult, it was bittersweet, sad, and shocking. I tried to strike up a conversation with my contemporaries who clearly were hesitant to openly speak about their government. So you see, I know firsthand that the American media, committed to its watchdog function, can be and must be a powerful remedy for wrong. Data-driven investigative journalism is critically important today more than ever. Tonight's finalists demonstrate journalism's power to illuminate government overreach and highlight corrective actions. We're disappointed, however, that for the second year in a row, we could not honor this work in person. Yet we have organized a celebration that captures the spirit of the awards and their namesake, the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation. We present this year's awards with a measure of sadness because as you may know, our journalist Ron Nixon will join David in conversation. David joined the BGA in 2018 after a career that included stints at the Chicago Tribune and Sun-Times, as well as regional bureaus of national and global news organizations. While leading the BGA's successful efforts to uncover public corruption, waste, and fraud from the city to the suburbs and Springfield, David has also become a leading voice on good government issues through his regular columns in the Chicago Tribune and Crane's Chicago Business, and as a guest on local radio and television programs. Marta, thank you for that great introduction. More importantly, we are grateful to have you, a skilled journalist, co-chairing the board's investigations committee. And it's nice to be dressed up and coming out of our COVID hibernation. Tonight, we will be honoring some incredibly complex and powerful feats of investigative journalism. As we recognize other newsrooms, it's with great pride that I update you on the BJ's own output over the last year. The circuit, which remains ongoing, had reporters and editors gather, organize, and analyze decades of data from the Cook County court system. Partnering with the Chicago Reporter, Injustice Watch, and civic tech consultants DataMade, the BGA spent more than a year on the most ambitious investigation in the BGA's recent history, published in late 2020. Cook County is the second largest unified court system in the country, so this was a massive undertaking. This first-of-its-kind examination of the inner workings of the county court system exposed how different defendants charged with similar crimes are treated, dissected trends in how prosecutors have charged people, and studied how well defendants have been represented by counsel. This reporting and the accompanying data visualization arrived at a time when issues of justice and fairness are taking center stage in the national discourse after years of criticism about biased treatment from law enforcement and the judicial system. Extracting and analyzing the data exposes systemic inequities and reveals biases in the fabric of the legal system that have been suspected for decades, but never definitively proven. We published two stories demonstrating inequities and plan to publish additional investigations in the months ahead. Just a couple of weeks ago, you may have seen our series, The Failures Before the Fires, published in collaboration with the Chicago Tribune. 
This extensive investigation showed how fires killed 61 Chicagoans from 2014 through 2019 in buildings where the fire safety violations had been reported, yet the city failed to adequately address them in time to save lives. BGA reporter Madison Hopkins and Chicago Tribune reporter Cecilia Reyes spent two years investigating these preventable fatalities, which occurred in mostly low-income neighborhoods populated by black and Latino residents. There are many other major stories I could mention, but I also want to recognize the successes of our policy team. They continue to push for ethics reform and fair redistricting, and they also lead the fight for transparency and access to public records. They helped block city council approval of a settlement that would have avoided release of Chicago Police Department misconduct records. They urged aldermen to advance an important police transparency measure and continued to remind Mayor Lori Lightfoot of her campaign promise to support transparent, accountable government. The BJ continues to sue for access to records detailing the operations at Navy Pier, and we continue to win. Two courts have agreed that Navy Pier Inc. is subject to public records laws, and a recent Illinois Supreme Court ruling supports the BJ position that Navy Pier records belong to the public. A new BGA investigation shows exactly how much this pension for government secrecy can affect taxpayers. Under an ethics law meant to encourage transparency, government bodies in Illinois that illegally withhold public records must pay the legal fees of the reporters or advocates who must sue to get the information. Our reporting shows the city has paid out $2.4 million to plaintiff's lawyers in the last decade. This is the kind of valuable information that skilled investigative reporting brings to you. And our policy work helps secure access to vital public documents. At the BGA, we're working hard every day to find and share these stories and engage Illinois residents who demand better government. We can do this only with your support. We're grateful for all who have made our past work possible. And we hope that each of you will consider advancing our work with a gift. You can give online right now at donate.bettergov.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Today, it's our privilege to listen in as two experienced journalists discuss the ins and outs of investigative reporting. Ron Nixon is Global Investigations Editor at the Associated Press, where he oversees the news agency's investigative unit. He has overseen investigations that won numerous honors. Most recently in 2020, his team won an Emmy in collaboration with the PBS Frontline Group for an investigation into the record-breaking numbers of migrant children in detention. A second collaboration with Frontline and the Global Reporting Center exploring the impact of COVID-19 on the global medical supply chain won an award from investigative reporters and editors. Ron also recently received the inaugural 2021 News Leader of the Year Award from the News Leaders Association. Now let's listen in as David and Ron chat. Ron Nixon, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and congratulations on that award. That's, that's quite a, uh, a great kudo to you and, and your work. There's another award, we're at a war, an award show, and there's another award I wanna ask you about, which is last year's Pulitzer Citation for Ida B. Wells. Right. And as a co-founder of the Ida B. Wells Society, um, tell me a little bit about what that means to you and what was the Pulitzer Committee trying to say in honoring her intrepid investigative reporting about lynchings in particular? Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, I really appreciate uh, being, it's an honor to be able to, to do this. Um, I think that it is, it is, it is overdue recognition for the work that she did because when you, like when I was growing up, you know, I obviously heard about Ida Tarbell and Lincoln Stephens and Upton Sinclair and, you know, all the, all the great muckrakers, but she was rarely mentioned in, in that. And so I think that this is well overdue recognition. Uh, and it, it, it was also very special because it occurred the same year that one of our co-founders, Nicole Hannah-Jones, also won the Pulitzer Prize. So, you know, great for Ida B. Wells Society all around. I don't have any, you know, insider information on why this, this occurred, 
I, I am just thrilled that that it did because, you know, as I said, she she did so much work uh, that has not gotten its due, and I, I'm happy that she was finally able uh, to be recognized for her contributions to the field of investigative reporting, and particularly for people of color in the field of investigative reporting. This is this is not new. I. I... I'd like to ask you a little bit about your own career in journalism, and really the arc of your career is quite interesting, uh, the various bases that you've touched and uh, what you've become and the impact that your work has had. Um, you didn't necessarily start out in life to be a journalist. I think you uh, had an interest in, in music theory and, and composition, and uh, you happened into journalism almost yes. by accident. Yeah, I, I got into journalism purely, you know, by accident. I, I to make a long story short, I happened to to, to go to um, uh, boot camp, uh, army boot camp, one summer to help pay for college in the National Guard. Wandered into this this publishing company because I thought that they published like books, and they told me they published newspapers and invited me back to be an intern the next year. And it kind of started from there. Um, well, it did start from there. And so I, um, you know, 33 years later, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's probably what I'm supposed to do. And I'm curious, um, how long was it before you really consider yourself an investigative reporter, uh, you know, a journalist for starters, and then an investigative reporter? It, it really started when I was assigned to do a story uh, and, and to keep it short, ended up finding out that the, the police act in Columbia, South Carolina, accidentally recording themse recorded themselves beating a black man. Whoa. And I got a copy of the videotape. And I did the story for this, this little weekly newspaper, and it just blew up. And, you know, I got subpoenaed, uh, or I got a summons from the magistrate uh, to appear in court to tell where, the, where, the, where I got the videotape. And so again, going back to J school, I had no idea that I wasn't supposed to like go and tell them. And so I was telling my editor that I got to go to court and tell them where I got the videotape from. And he was like, no, 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 no. We don't do that. <laughs> That's not how Whoa, whoa. So he was just like, well, you know, we go to jail to protect our sources. And I was like, jail, dude, I, I don't do jail. Like, when did you pick up the skill set uh, that of computer assisted reporting, which is really a specialty in investigative reporting work. Yeah, so the, I, I started in what's, you know, because CAR today is called data journalism. It's gone to <laughs> names. And so, I guess I'm dating myself uh, with that yeah, question. <laughs> I, no, I actually started that back at the weekly newspaper. Oh, wow. Uh, I had done a story about um, teacher salary. And this local gadfly, this guy um, who, I don't know, I guess he didn't like teachers. He convinced me that teachers were not uh, overpaid or they, that they basically, he, that they were overpaid, I'm sorry. And so when you looked at the, the, the trajectory of the teacher's salary, he was like, look at this. They only work like a few months out of a year and look at this. And so... You know, I did the story and about two days after the story came out, I got a letter and I never forget it. The, the letter said, hey, math boy, ever heard of adjusting for inflation? And so <laughs> I said to myself, like, nope. Uh, and so the receptionist at the newspaper taught me how to use a spreadsheet, uh, Quattro Pro. This is before Microsoft Excel. Right. So she taught me how to use a spreadsheet and it grew from there. Right. Uh, just using a spreadsheet to analyze. And so I would throw in like campaign contributions that I would type in and, and it, it just, it grew, you know, the, the more I got into doing investigative reporting, the more that I saw that it was a, a, a useful tool. Right. Um, did you acquire better math skills or, or was it just the spreadsheets? I, I, uh... I, I did acquire <laughs> Better math. <laughs> I guess being called math boy might uh, might have that effect. On yes, it, it, it does have that effect. Yeah, I, I want, I'm going to jump a little bit forward to some, some more modern uh, times for you. Uh, you uh, and you mentioned uh, Nicole Hannah Jones uh, and um, 
uh, the founding of, um, along with Topher Sanders, right. of the Ida B. Wells Society. And um, I have never heard the backstory of what led you three, certainly the need for it, and you can explain the need for it a little bit, but tell me about like what sort of conversation led to the three of you deciding to undertake this really important mission of the Ida B. Wells Society. Right. So we were at a at a conference in Atlanta and 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 just really were sitting there talking. Is I, I didn't know Nicole. Uh, I knew Topher, I met him once, and then Corey Johnson, who was also one of the founders of the organization too. And we're just talking amongst ourselves about the, the lack of people who look like us in, in the field of investigative uh, reporting. And so over lunch, we were saying, well, you know, there are organizations that exist, but that's not their primary focus. You know, they, they do try to bring in people, but there's not a singular focus on getting people of color into this. So over lunch, we were like, well, since there isn't anything, why don't we do it? And so over a series of weeks, over the weekends, we drew up like ideas and we had meetings over the phone. This is all like, you know, just the four of us. Uh, and then, you know, at NABJ in 2016, uh, we just decided, we talked to NABJ and they were gracious enough to uh, let us debut at the at their uh, conference there that they had. That's the National the Association of Black Journalists. National right? Association of Black Journalists. Right. But the but the idea there though is is that when you as I mentioned back to like Ida B. Wells, right? When you look back at the history of investigative reporting, you know people like Woodward and Bernstein come up if you're like, um, sort of more modern. Uh, but then, you know, the Lincoln Steffens and, and, uh, and Ida Tarbo and that whole McClure's and that muckraking thing, Upton Sinclair in the jungle. That's what you're like inundated with. You don't hear about like W.B. Du Bois himself uh, in the May 1919 issue of the Crisis magazine basically did a WikiLeaks. He got documents leaked to him about how the Americans sent memos to the French on how black troops were supposed to be treated. And the post office seized all the magazines. They wow. seized like every last one of them. Or, you know, so, you know, there were so it's, it's, it has existed, but the thing is we just didn't know the history of it. So as a result, we don't think of ourselves as going into these fields, despite people like, you know, Dean Baquet, who right. was an investigative reporter. Yeah, well, um, the Times itself, when she was publishing, didn't they make a reference to her as a slanderous and nasty-minded uh, mulatress? Right. <laughs> yeah, and it was the New York Times that said that. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. Right. It, it shows you a little bit about how far we've come, although there's still a long way to go. So I think it's great to get more black journalists doing investigative work and uh, any diversity that can be contributed to our field is, is significant. Um, what about the, the next step up the ladder, besides becoming great investigative reporters, uh, becoming editors and becoming newsroom leaders like, like you are? What right. needs to be done uh, to, to do better with regard to that next step? I'm concerned of people being in the newsroom, but where they are in the newsroom. And that includes, like, while it's great to have reporters, you need people in these decision-making roles as well. Um, and, and look, that doesn't mean that we're only gonna, gonna cover or assign stuff that has to do with, with race and ethnicity. I mean, I, I, I do everything, like, you know, I, I run a global uh, operation. And so we, we do everything from palm oil to, you know, uh, Chinese propaganda. But I, I think it does give you a different perspective and, and those perspectives need to, need to be in the upper echelons of leadership. It still remains a, a big problem in journalism, it seems to me. Um, uh, and maybe getting more, people, yeah, getting more people with, with un, unorthodox backgrounds like you is maybe another way to, uh, to, to kind of open up, the, open up the pool of talent. We've lived through a very interesting, and we are living through a very interesting moment in history. And the January 6th insurrection, uh, uh, the AP did some sensational enterprising work on the January 6th insurrection. I was wondering if any of your military training and having an instinct for 
where to go to look for records about uh, the way law enforcement and firefighters were affected. Were, were affected. Uh, I was wondering sort of what guided your work as you assigned this fast breaking story and then you layer on top of it the investigative work that your team did. Tell us a little bit about how that worked and how you followed your news instincts in terms of mo like mobilizing your group to attack that story. Right. So, you know, the investigative team, we're, we're set up to do quick turnaround, middle, you know, sort of mid and long term investigation. And obviously for something like this, you've got to have people who can do all three. So I, I think the best decision I made, one of the best decisions I made in being in this job is my first hire uh, was a young man, James Laporta. Uh, James Laporta, like myself, is a veteran of the US military. He recognized, I, I think it was a Proud Boy, a formation that they were using as they were moving through the crowd. He recognized that. And that became what, sort of the spine of our, our story, which is why it pays to have like vets in the newsroom. Because, you know, James did several tours in Afghanistan. And, and obviously, you know, he, he's going to recognize things, things <laughs> like that. So I, I, that, you know, I think that was a decision about personnel, but hiring someone with a similar background, but a more recent background in, in the military and being able to do. And then, you know. Hey, can I interrupt? T t tell us a little more about having, you know, quick turn, medium term, longer term. In, an in a situation like that, um, how do you deploy people sort of on all three vectors in order right. to get news? Yeah. Right. So, you know, obviously, immediately, we need to find out what happened. And so I've got people like uh, Michael Biesecker, who's based in D.C., who is really good with quick turnaround. Things. So pairing him with James and James's military knowledge and his his sources, along with um, uh, I, I forget, I'm blanking on Jake's name, but a, a law enforcement um, AP reporter who's not on the team, um, was a very good reporter in in Texas. Having the two of them team up with with the, the law enforcement reporter to be able to do this. But at the same time, Martha Mendoza and Juliet Linderman were filing FOIAs for the communications for all the police forces around DC to respond to the, and so we got a, a ton of stuff from that. Which was more the mid, mid, mid range kind of reporting, right? Mm -hmm. Right. right. And, and so, you know, that's how we were able to, to really deploy that because it's like we're looking at, like, we need to do this now, but what's the bigger story here? Um, and we did, you know, that particular story because we were able to get, like, a ton of documents about what was occurring, what the paramedics were saying, um, what the police were saying uh, to that. Point. And then using James's uh, sources in the military, we were getting information, and my own sources in the military, we were getting information about what was happening with the Pentagon. I'd like to ask you a, a couple of concluding questions. One is that at the AP, uh, you uh, have client news organizations all around the U.S. and around the world who have ever-shrinking news holes. Right. And uh, you do major investigations that run uh, thousands of words, some of them. Right. Uh, you really see the brunt of the decline in the business model of commercial journalism in particular. Yes. Uh, tell us what that looks like from your perspective and how does that affect the kinds of stories that are being done by investigative journalists like those at the AP? Well, so I, I think that there, you know, there is a decline in commercial uh, you know, outlets and obviously AP is a B2B, right? So we're not like the New York Times or you, you post stuff just for yourself, we're providing this to other people. And while there are shrinking news holes, you know, what we do find is our investigations get widespread use. Uh, and, and that because as news organizations are able, less able to do this, AP can fill that, that void. And AP has diversified its revenue stream over the years and is still working to, to do that, which, which, which helps because it is, it's a not-for-profit, so, you know, it can tap the, the, the uh, foundation sector uh, for, 
And so it's changing its business model ever so slightly to adjust to these, these new realities. Ron, you sent me a kind note about the investigation we just published with the Chicago Tribune about fires in Chicago, 61 people dying uh, right. over a number of years from fires in buildings that previously had been inspected uh, that uh, the city just really didn't follow up and keep people safe. Right. Uh, tell me, um, why is this kind of story important to people in the residents of the city of Chicago or people in other cities around the country? Well, I think it's important because these are the kinds of things that sort of fall through the cracks, right? Um, both in terms of how city, cities with declining resources, they don't have inspectors to go out and do these kinds of things, whereas, you know, we being able to, and so they just, they're just forgotten. And, and by going through and looking at, at this, you put a, and, and also what happens too is that the media at, 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 in some cases tend to do these things as sort of episodic. So you got one over here, you got one over there, but nobody puts a complete picture together. And I think that's what, you, that's what I was impressed about by you putting all of it together to show what was happening here. And, and so those things are critically important because again, a lot of time government finds out stuff from us. And, you know, we're the ones pointing out that, you know, there's, there are no controls in place here or that people are dying here. And, and then they react to it. So that's critical because like most of the time they don't, because again, they don't have the resources to do this. Most cities are cash strapped. You know, they're, they're trying to figure out where do you put resources and things like this just, you know, don't, don't make the cut. And let me, uh, let me close with, with a question. Um, the theme of our event tonight is uh, a remedy for wrong, uh, taken from the Ida B. Wells quote. Uh, um, uh, and I'm wondering, given what we've just talked about with regard to policing and, and other issues we've talked about, palm oil and uh, right. you know, slave work, et cetera, um, do you still, do you see investigative journalism still serving as, as a remedy for wrong? As I mentioned to you before, <clears throat> I think that Maya Burrell would probably still be in, in prison if it wasn't for uh, Robin McDowell uh, taking on the case. He had had two trials, multiple appeals, and he was still in prison. And she looks into the case, examines this, tracks down witnesses <clears throat> that the police didn't track down. And he walks out of prison in December, 11 months after the story comes out. And you look at, and not just us, but throughout the, the industry, you see reporting that's done, people are out of jail, folks are poisoned, dangerous products taken off, politicians resigning after wrongdoing is exposed. Take us out of the equation and imagine what happens. So I think that, look, we still, we have, still have a critical role to play in society. And even sometimes people who say they don't agree with us will agree with us on things that affect them. Uh, and, and so this is, this is a critical role that we continue to play despite everything that's going on in the industry and, and even despite everything that goes going on in the country where you have, you know, people are divided politically. Ron, uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you for the incredible work that you've done as a journalist, for the leadership that you've shown in our profession, uh, for the leadership you're showing at the AP. And thank you for joining us today for our event. Uh, it's meant a lot to have you with us and I think people will really have enjoyed uh, the conversation you and I have just had. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. And my only regret is that we couldn't do it in person. But thank you so much for having me. There's still hope for post-COVID times, but they're not quite here yet. <laughs> not quite. Not quite yet. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Ron. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Our times demand that we continue to dig deep to uncover injustices and inequities. As Ida B. Wells said, 
There must always be a remedy for wrong and injustice if we only know how to find it. The search for facts calls for the skilled and tenacious reporting by the BGA and by all the peers we recognize today. I'm pleased to say that we've seen some extraordinary examples of that tenacity in our submissions. They include 27 entries across print, radio, TV, and online, and many collaborations among news organizations. Reading this great material and rating the entries fell to our distinguished panel of judges. They are a group of seasoned reporters and editors who know great investigative journalism, know our state, and have the ability to select the very best from a strong group of entries. Thank you, Laura Washington, Chris Bury, Brant Houston, and Charles Whitaker for the time and effort you put into this year's awards. Before we present our 2021 awards, I want to recognize the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation, which makes our award program possible. At last year's virtual edition of this event, Richard Driehaus spoke passionately about fact-filled journalism and the role of a free press in a democratic society. As we recognize our 2021 winners, Richard is here with us in spirit. We miss you, Richard. Here are this year's finalists. In the early days of the pandemic, when most government officials were describing the coronavirus as colorblind, Dua Eldeeb and her colleagues who covered health care at ProPublica already suspected that that was not the case. Given what they already knew about racial disparities in that system, they thought the pandemic could take a devastating toll on black Americans and expose the cracks in care that rendered them so vulnerable. They immediately got to work, requesting racial data on deaths before most agencies, not even the CDC or the Illinois Department of Public Health, had begun to break the information out in that way. Eldeeb filed multiple public records requests with the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office and, following one lengthy conversation with her, the office started to include race in its daily dispatches of COVID-related deaths. The resulting piece, the first 100, COVID-19 took Black Lives First, It Didn't Have To, which published on May 9th, refuted the easy explanation being given for disparate outcomes for Black Americans, that they were simply less healthy and that the causes were entrenched and nearly impossible to fix, to investigate whether deaths were avoidable, which problems were fixable, and who needed to be held accountable. Reporters found that though the victims were vulnerable, their deaths were not inevitable. The story illuminated the revelation with unparalleled scope, depth, and resonance. ProPublica's other work on the impact of the pandemic on vulnerable populations similarly broke new ground. They were the first news organization to report that the coronavirus pandemic had left some seniors dangerously isolated in public and subsidized housing around the city, with only a patchwork support system in place to help them. Reporters Mick Dumkey and Haru Karen found more than a half a dozen residents of these communities had been dead for days before they were found, part of a large spike in deaths with the onset of the pandemic. Melissa Sanchez led early coverage of the treatment of factory workers and temporary agency employees during the pandemic, documenting the working conditions that made many feel unsafe and identifying lack of government action in addressing concerns about outbreaks. She also broke the news that a coronavirus outbreak at a Heartland Alliance facility on Chicago's South Side was the largest outbreak of the virus in any shelter for immigrant youth in the country. Corinne conducted an analysis of COVID infections in Chicago that showed crowded conditions within homes, not housing density, better explained why some areas of the city, primarily those on the west and south sides, saw higher rates of infection than others. That finding, coming at a time when the common assumption was that density was to blame for large outbreaks, would become generally acknowledged not long after. And... Sanchez and LD were the first to report that opioid overdoses had spiked in Cook County during the pandemic, with more than twice as many people dying of overdoses 
or suspected overdoses in the first five months of 2020 in Cook County when compared with the same period the previous year. Much like the coronavirus outbreak, the opioid epidemic disproportionately affected African Americans on Chicago's west and south sides. Six weeks later, county officials announced plans to address the crisis. There's so much focus on racial injustice right now. It's history in the nation and Chicago. Part of that history includes redlining. The term comes from maps made by the federal government in the late 1930s. They drew red lines around African-American neighborhoods and urged banks to steer clear, not to offer home loans there. WBEZ and the nonprofit newsroom City Bureau have been looking deeply into mortgage lending in Chicago now. Our findings could make you think modern-day redlining is alive and well. WBEZ's Linda Lutton has the story. Anytime anyone applies for a loan to buy a house or a condominium or a giant apartment building, any kind of housing, the lender must report that, along with a bunch of details. Who applied for the loan? What happened to the loan? Where it was done? Did it apply for this federal program or that federal program? That's Andrew Fan from City Bureau. He crunched much of the data for this story, and he knows that data inside out. He used to work at a bank compiling these numbers for submission to the federal government. A uh, really boring process. But then, you know, I realized you could actually take all that data and look at it, you know, for everyone, from my own bank, for every other bank. And you could really see how everyone was doing side by side, what neighborhoods they were lending in, uh, what communities they were lending in and also where they were. Where banks and other financial institutions lend matters. Researchers like Brett Theodos of the Urban Institute say home loans are the single biggest way money flows into Chicago communities. Even if you rent, home loans in your neighborhood make a huge difference in what your community is like. It determines whether you have a pharmacy to shop at or a dry cleaner to go to. It determines what rehabilitation work is going to happen to the multifamily stock that's in your neighborhood determines what other single family stock is going to be coming to your neighborhood. We looked at seven years of lending beginning in 2012. In that time, banks and other financial institutions loaned $57 billion for people to buy homes in Chicago. We made a map that plots out where all that money goes in the city. The map shows investment piled high over the city's white neighborhoods. In many black neighborhoods, it's barely visible. And lending is so closely tied to the race of the area, you might think you're looking at one of the old redlining maps. In their story, thousands of foster children were sent out of state to mental health facilities where some faced abuse and neglect. Reporters David Jackson, formerly with the Chicago Tribune, and Dua Eldeeb with ProPublica Illinois exposed the worst of failings by a public agency, those that cause harm to children. Their reporting revealed how child welfare officials in Illinois and other states had placed thousands of foster children in facilities across the country where they reported being beaten or sexually assaulted by other residents or mistreated by workers. Officials from the DCFS and child welfare agencies in other states sent away children as young as seven and were unable to properly monitor their safety or treatment. The results were devastating. Experts agree that sending a child to an out-of-state institution should be a last resort because it can weaken family bonds, disrupt a child's development, and place the child at risk for abuse. Yet, Illinois officials sent children to facilities in more than a dozen different states. Some children had serious medical and psychiatric diagnoses, records of juvenile delinquency, and histories of running away. Children bounced from facility to facility in journeys so frequent and far-flung they sometimes resembled an airline flight map. One Illinois girl was sent to four different facilities hundreds of miles from home. At one, 
She said an employee pulled her into a bathroom, blocked her from escaping, and sexually assaulted her. A 16-year-old boy was transferred from a Chicago psychiatric hospital to an out-of-state facility where he said he was attacked several times during his first few weeks. He said he became violent just to survive. Illinois officials often placed children in an Indiana facility where police had investigated dozens of battery allegations, including attacks that left children in need of hospital care. They also relied on several institutions run by for-profit companies that had faced numerous allegations of mistreatment at facilities that were later closed. Although police were often called to the institutions, the state agencies charged with protecting children did not always see or act on the police reports. In response to the story, the ACLU of Illinois, which monitors the Child Welfare Agency as part of a federal consent decree, called the department's failings infuriating and demanded that officials develop services that would allow children to stay in Illinois. We hope never to see another investigation reveal conditions like this again, an ACLU attorney said in a statement. More than half the Illinoisans who died from COVID-19 are nursing home residents, but the virus's spread through the nursing home industry has not been even. A WBEZ analysis of state and federal data has found more infections and deaths per bed in facilities run for profit. Those nursing homes do especially poorly in parts of the state where the pandemic has hit hardest. We reported on our analysis that found the for-profit facilities put up a weaker fight against the virus, partly because they had lower staffing coverage. So it would be easy to conclude the for-profits are bad, the non-profits are good. But as WBEZ's Chip Mitchell reports, that'd be far too simple. But a nursing home's ownership would be a matter of life and death during the pandemic. A WBEZ analysis of state and federal data found that nonprofit nursing homes in Illinois put up a stronger fight against COVID than for-profit facilities. In the 20 counties hit hardest by the virus, the deaths per bed in nonprofit facilities were about half. That's partly because the nonprofits have more staffing and partly because of who they allow to move in and who they keep out. If you're on Medicaid, most not-for-profit nursing homes will then say, we do not want you because it costs us three times as much as Medicaid pays to take care of you. So forget it. Karen Masser says the nonprofit facilities turn away Medicaid recipients for a good reason. They want to stay in business. They have to be financial stewards of, you know, considering their other residents. Messer heads Leading Age Illinois, a group that lobbies for the nonprofits. They're unwilling to buy lesser quality food for everyone or drop down their staffing ratios. That refusal to skimp on quality may have saved lives as the coronavirus tore through nursing homes. But while nonprofits have performed much better against COVID, they're so exclusive, they're not really an option for most people. The people who've exhausted their resources for long-term care or never had any to begin with, they end up in facilities run for profit. Donna Ginther says that helps explain why for-profit nursing homes have had so many more COVID deaths. I've just gotten home from work. And while I was undressing, in my bedroom. It was a cold February night, and Ann Jeanette Young, a social worker, had just finished her shift at the hospital. You see them running up to the apartment complex <laughs> with the battering ram in their hand. Chicago Police Station work! A crowbar. It was so traumatic to hear the way the thing was hitting the door. And it happened so fast, I didn't have time to put on clothes. And suddenly, she found herself frozen in fear. Completely naked. In a room full of men. Nine body cameras rolling. 
And you're just standing there. And I'm just standing there. I mean, terrified, humiliated, not even understanding why in that moment that this is happening to me. If I had made one wrong move, I felt like they would have shot me. I truly believe that they would have shot me. I watched that video and I put myself in that poor woman's place. There were big guns and guns with lights and scopes on them. Because we couldn't be together again this year, we wanted to give you a chance to get involved in the spirit of these awards. Once again, we are presenting a Reader's Choice Award. We announced the finalist about a few weeks ago and invited you, the fans and followers of investigative journalism, to vote for your favorite. Here's David Greising to announce the winner of the 2021 Reader's Choice Award. I couldn't be more impressed with the outstanding crop of submissions we received this year and the truly outstanding finalists. You were impressed too. We received hundreds of votes for the winner of this year's Reader's Choice Award. It is my great pleasure to award the 2021 Reader's Choice Award to Dave Savini, Sama Assad, Michelle Youngerman, Mike Klingley, Deandra Taylor, Reed Nolan, Don Stanky, Alfredo Roman, Chris McKnight, Dave Kennebrew, Tim Visti, Lana Hinshaw Clan, and Tony Diasio of WBBM for My Name is Anjanette Young. This CBS2 special presentation began with a report of an innocent social worker who was handcuffed naked when Chicago police raided the wrong home. The investigation explored a systemic problem within the department, shoddy police work leading officers to break down wrong door after wrong door, traumatizing families. Now it's on to the main event. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Anne Lazar, Executive Director of the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation, who will announce the winners of the 2021 Driehaus Awards. Anne and Richard knew each other for more than three decades. She began her career at Driehaus Securities, working alongside Mr. Driehaus in what then was a fairly small investment shop. Anne left to focus on her family and in 2019 returned to the Driehaus fold to run the foundation. She has been a great friend to the BGA and to the many organizations that the foundation supports. Thank you, Marta, and thank you to the Better Government Association for giving me the honor of presenting these awards. I know we all share in the sorrow that Richard is no longer with us to play this role, but I am pleased to carry on his legacy and present the awards in his name. Richard loved this program. As you heard earlier, he believed in the press and the important role that journalists play in safeguarding our democracy. He funded this program to ensure that hardworking investigative reporters who spent months and sometimes years working on a story were properly recognized. He especially enjoyed this event when we were in person. The opportunity to meet and talk with nominated reporters energized him. All of us at the Foundation share the pride of recalling the inspiring investigations honored over the years and knowing that these stories made an impact and remedied wrongs. This year is no exception. You have seen the clips describing the powerful stories of this year's finalists, and we hope you have read, watched, and listened to them as well. So, with no further ado, I will put the finalists out there, out of their suspense. The third prize of $3,000 goes to City Bureau's Linda Lutton, Andrew Fan, Alden Lowry, Aaron Allen, and Ashish Valentine for Where Banks Don't Lend. Congratulations to the team. I'm Linda Lutton, Neighborhoods Reporter at WBEZ Chicago. We want to thank the BGA for recognizing our work on racially disparate mortgage lending across Chicago neighborhoods. Uh, and we are so honored to be in the company of the other amazing finalists for the 2021 Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Awards. Everyone is incredible. What an important body of reporting this is. And I'm Andrew Fan from City Bureau. It was not a surprise that banks lend out more money in Chicago's white neighborhoods than they do in the city's Black and Latino communities. 
but the scale of the disparity we documented was shocking. This is reporting that we know resonated in many Chicago communities. We saw activists use the reporting um, to confront banks, and we saw the banks acknowledge that they need to do better. This was also a collaboration between two newsrooms and lots of people. I want to shout out to my partners at City Bureau, especially Aaron Allen and Ashish Valentine, and to WBEZ editors Alden Lowry and the amazing Kate Gahan. And so thank you again to the BGA for recognizing this work. It's a tremendous honor. The second prize of $7,000 goes to ProPublica Midwest for COVID-19 inequities. Congratulations to all. We'd like to thank the Better Government Association for honoring us with the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Award for Investigative Reporting. We also want to congratulate the other finalists who produce such powerful journalism. It's an honor to be recognized. Our series of stories investigated COVID-19 inequities and the pandemic's disproportionate toll on black and brown Chicagoans. What we found was that though the victims were vulnerable, their deaths were not inevitable. When officials were still describing the coronavirus as colorblind, our team suspected otherwise. We worked together to reveal racial disparities in addition to a lack of government oversight and a patchwork of solutions that left the most vulnerable behind. On behalf of the rest of our colleagues at ProPublica, thank you again for this award. And finally, I am pleased to present the first prize of $15,000 in the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Awards for investigative reporting to WBBM-TV for my name is Anjanette Young. We just want to thank everyone for the BGA and the Richard H. Driehaus honor. Um, our investigative team at CBS worked tirelessly for the last three years on this project, but in the last year alone, um, we had conducted so many stories on the wrong raid on Anjanette Young's home. And joining me are two of the producers, the, the main producers, investigative producers on the project, Michelle Youngerman, and Sama Assad. We all want to thank you for this award. Thank you so much. This is truly a, an honor. And it's an honor for all those people who have been wrongly rated and were brave enough to speak out and share their stories so that we were able to expose the problems that we did. And you know we're so grateful. Just to bounce off what Michelle said, we're we're so grateful, obviously, for this award. But like she said, to the people who came forward and weren't afraid, or were afraid and still came forward and were brave enough to tell their stories, we could not have uh, told the story of Anjanette Young without her. We could not have told the other stories of victims of you know CPD wrong raids without them and and without their courage. So um, this this award is is for them. And this investigation uh, did not come without its own obstacles. Uh, we were uh, threatened uh, legally to pull the story down, to not air the story. Uh, an injunction uh, was attempted by the city of Chicago to stop CBS from airing this. And our station and our lawyers stood firm and fought for our right to uh, reveal for the first time the body camera footage of what happened to Anjanette Young that night. And um, as we all know, it turned into um, an investigation about transparency. And that's what this is all about, the transparency and the investigative journalism. None of this would have been possible without the bravery of Anjanette Young and um, her coming forward to tell her story and coming to us to help fight for the body camera footage and all the other records involving all the other wrong raids that have led to new laws now and new policy. There's a new search warrant policy on the books as we speak. So again, um, looking back at this investigation, we wouldn't be here without our great team, our management, all of our talented photographers and editors, Jeff Harris, our vice president of news, our news director, and uh, Tiffany Lipensky, our content creator, director of content. So again, thank you all. And we'll, we'll leave the final word here to Anjanette Young. Thank you for being the investigator that you are and shining a light on this, not giving up on it, and 
I know you, I appreciate that you're doing it for me, but I know you don't do it just for me. I know that there are so many families and so many women and children who um, appreciate the work that you, Day Savini, in Channel 2 Chicago are doing as it relates to this matter. Congratulations to all and thank you to everyone who entered. Thank you, Anne, for leading us in honoring all this tremendous work. And thank you for your leadership of the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation, which has been a loyal and significant supporter of the BGA and of investigative journalism overall. I'd like to echo your thanks and acknowledge the winners, the finalists, all who submitted entries, and all who are out there doing the painstaking work of investigative journalism year round. Ron, thank you for sharing your insights about the importance and the future of this work. Marta, we thank you for guiding us so smoothly through the show. Finally, thank you to all who watched, applauded, and supported this extraordinary work, and for those who remain committed to the BGA's fight for good government. Each one of the stories we honored here today calls out heartrending mistreatment, injustice, and inequality. As part of its mission, the BGA is committed to exposing injustice where we find it, with the ultimate goal of remedying wrongs. We work for a fair, efficient, effective government that serves the people of Illinois, the government you deserve. As we conclude, we wish to once again recognize our benefactor, Richard Driehaus, for his passionate embrace of investigative reporting. Since his untimely passing, we are grateful to Ann Lazar and the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation for sustaining this commitment. We hope you will support independent nonprofit news and join the fight for better government. You can support our work at donate.bettergov.org. We are grateful. Once again, thank you for joining us to celebrate investigative journalism.